Oh, good morning, Cornerstone Church. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> hey, um, I said this in the first service, and I, I want to say it again. Um, I am so grateful to get to be a part of such an awesome, awesome church, and especially such a wonderful pastoral staff. Uh, every week, Randy uh, gets his awesome team together and just leads us right into the presence of God, and I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for all of their effort, their work to be able to do that for us. And I'm grateful for Pastor Mark and all the work that he does behind the scenes and the great ideas that our church benefits from. It's so cool. And of course, Pastor Anthony as well and his leadership and his vision to help guide our church onto God's will, which is what we're doing right now. This is, this is God's will. You're here. You're learning. We're, we're focusing on God. What an exciting thing. So glad you're here. So glad you're all watching online as well. Have you ever felt like there's a design in life? Perhaps you might even say things seem intentional or destined. Some people will say things like, wow, they're, they're destined for greatness. Or it must be fate. I agree that we all have a design and a purpose. There is great intentionality with which God has created your existence and ordained your life. And this is good news for us this morning. There is a design for everyone here today. Yet many of us would also agree that we tend to have moments that feel outside of God's design. We we wonder, how could this happen? Or why did I do that? We don't have to dig too deep to find the answer that sinfulness is to blame. But not entirely. Often we willfully go along with it. Or we try to balance it with our Christianity. We need a reset on a myriad of areas in our life. And this morning, we will meet a man not too dissimilar from ourselves. Despite a lot of scholastic debate about him, we will clearly see that he would have benefited greatly from a reset in his life. See, he was at the top of his career with incredible success. He was widely known as one of the most capable and proficient individuals in his industry. He had the parking spot, he had the corner office, probably a timeshare in Florida, like the whole deal, y'all. His name is Balaam. And he was a prestigious seer, a, a soothsayer, a man of mystic arts. And he had a track record of incredible success. See, Balaam was known for his specialty in manipulating the spirits and the gods to do as he requested. Many people recognized him as one of the most spiritually aware people of the time. Yet Balaam had a fatal flaw in desperate need of a reset. For all his seeing, all of his spiritual perceptiveness, he was blind to the truth. Balaam was blind to the truth of our God and how he is the one true God. It may be a painful reality, but we must agree that we might be blind to a variety of sinful things in our own lives. A kind of spiritual blindness that leads us into unhealthy behavior or worse. In fact, I must warn anyone who feels complacent or turns a blind eye to all the evidence of their sin, you are in grave danger, my friend. Balaam was a man used by God. He spoke with God. He heard from God, yet he was altogether blind to God and his own destructive behavior. He would ultimately be killed during a battle against the Israelites, whom he blessed multiple times. So how could a man who spent actual time with God meet this kind of end? How could a spiritual man so in tune with the gods and widely praised as a seer a gifted seer, not see his own foolishness? What kind of reset did Balaam need for his heart to be changed? And how can we learn to receive God's wisdom to reset our own hearts? This morning, we're going to cover exactly that. And in the midst of this cautionary tale, I want you to look. I want you to look for the overarching message that God has for the Israelites way back in 597 B.C. And the message he has for us right here in 2021. So let me pray for us before we continue. God, humble our hearts, soften our pride that we may receive your wisdom and grace. 
Help us to engage with your truth, to focus on your precepts. Holy Father, awaken us from complacency and invigorate our faiths that we may turn from darkness and our eyes be opened by the power of your spirit. God, you alone know the fabric of our hearts and you alone can bless us with a reset that we may abide in you and do all things. Amen. So before we kind of really get into the meat of this, I want to give some background info. Whenever we just hop into a random book in the Bible, I want to kind of give you some background information. We're going to be studying Numbers uh, chapter 22. And so as you turn there uh, in your Bible or you look up on your phone, which I strongly suggest doing, we're going to be going through the entire chapter and kind of skimming through some parts. And it'll be really helpful to be able to read along as well. But I want to catch us up on what's been going on up to this point in the story and just uh, help us give a clearer picture of who Balaam is and kind of how he fits in this larger book. Now, Numbers may not be a typical book that people sign up for, for, you know, Bible studies and things like that, but it is a wonderful book filled with tons of applicable lessons for us. The book of Numbers, the name is derived from the fact that, you know, um, Israel took two major population censuses during the time, and there's lots of stats and, and numbers. However, there might be a better, more descriptive name for it, which is found in the first sentence in the Hebrew, uh, which means in the wilderness. The book of Numbers details the many events that the Israelites experienced during the 40 years they spent wandering in the desert or wilderness. And so much of this book points to the rebellious nature of God's people and the patience and faithfulness of God to protect, preserve, and supply their needs. Be sure to look for hints of this theme throughout our story this morning. So by the time we get to chapter 22, God has already done some pretty miraculous things. He's he's made water pour out from a rock. He's healed people from poisonous snake bites by simply looking at a, a bronze serpent on a staff. And what would come next might even be more difficult to believe. And as much as I would love to spend the next two hours breaking down every verse in the chapter, um, I'd also like to be invited back to preach again. So I'm just going to paraphrase a couple parts and we'll focus in on a couple select verses as we go through this chapter. So here we go. Let's get started. We're going to kind of look at verses 1 through 5 and I'm just going to kind of keep going and you'll just kind of follow along as you, as you skim over it. So we have this king, King Balak. He's the king of Moab, and he's really fearful. He's very afraid. The entire population of Israel has kind of moved in down the street, and he's terrified. He's heard of their great conquests. He's heard of the the other kingdoms they've overthrown and how they they came out of the great powerhouse of Egypt. And he sees them as a great threat to his own kingdom. So much so that his fear drives him to reach out to his allies, the Midianites. And together, they begin to conspire to wage war against the Israelites. But remember, they're both afraid, right? So they, they feel like they can't quite, you know, do it on their own. So they need to get some friends, maybe some some friends on the other side. If you've seen Princess and the Frog, you you might get that illusion. So they hire the services of a man named Balaam. Uh, He had this great, great reputation, almost like a little slogan, you know. And uh, King Balak says about him, He whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. It was well known that if if Balaam showed up and he's like, you're cursed, well, guess what? You're cursed. If he, came, if he came to your kingdom and said, your kingdom is blessed, your kingdom would be blessed and it would grow and would prosper. And he was very successful at having a wonderful career doing this. So they send this royal entourage to go solicit Balaam's services, promising, promising him great riches for his effort. And Balaam responds to this, this big party showing up. Lodge here tonight and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you? Now at this point, we kind of begin to see another identifier of Balaam's shallow understanding of who God is as he begins to explain to God and update him on all this new information that God might not be aware of. He tells him all about King Balak and how he wants to hire him. Uh, to, to curse the Israelites and, and all this new information, God, you know, they have another interaction. God's response to all of this update is, the, is as follows. You shall not go out with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, go to your own land for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. 
Do you notice that's not quite everything God said? This is kind of our first hint at some of Balaam's true character. Moving into verses 14, we're going to kind of go through 20. So at this point, King Balak is starting to get really upset because Balaam refused his first offer. So he decides to send an even more um, uh, lavish offer with more royal princes and, and even a bigger reward and greater promises of glory and honor. Let's focus again here on Balaam's response when this bigger, um, more dignified entourage arrives. I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. So, so you too, please stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. All right, now here's the part that gets a little wild if you're not familiar with Balaam and this story. It's kind of verses 22 through 35. We're going to spend a little bit of time here. The text informs us that at some point on his journey, uh, Balaam's journey, God became upset with Balaam and in fact sent an angel with a drawn sword to stand in his way. But only Balaam's donkey noticed the terrifying scene and attempted to turn away. Balaam becomes frustrated at what he thinks is, a, is simply a disobedient animal. So he gives the donkey a corrective strike. This happens two more times. Balaam's donkey seeing the angel, turning away, trying to avoid it. Balaam entirely unaware and continuing to strike his donkey. On the third time, the donkey just gives up. And lies on the ground. Let's dive in and see the crazy thing that happens next. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam naturally said back to the donkey, Because you have made a fool of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? Balaam said no. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand and he bowed down and fell on his face. So the angel and Balaam begin to exchange a few words, but there's one statement from Balaam in particular, that grants us another insight into his character. As he's being effectively rebuked by this sword-wielding angel before him, Balaam makes a puzzling statement. I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now, therefore, if it's evil in your sight, I'll, uh, I'll turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you. Now, personally, if I ever come across an angel with a sword standing in front of my car out there on Highlands Ranch Parkway, I'm not sticking around to ask him more questions. The drawn sword kind of makes the message clear. Guys, I, I'm getting out. But not for Balaam. Did you notice his if statement? If it's evil, it reminds me of those empty apologies that uh, public figures are prone to use. They say things like, well, if I offended you, then I'm, then I'm sorry. That's no apology at all. And frankly, at this point, we should begin to wonder if Balaam has some ulterior motive for all his bargaining. Lastly, Balaam arrives to meet King Balak and informs the king that he can only speak the word God puts in his mouth. But in a ridiculous irony, Balaam gives the first of four oracles, these kind of prophecies, this um, shared insight, right? Excuse me, to the king. And each time, instead of cursing Israel, he actually blesses them. Right in front of the growingly frustrated king. And for each of the first two oracles, Balaam requires the king to build a variety of altars and procure a litany of ceremonial steps to do this whole procedure and this whole um, deal. But the outcome is the same each time. Israel is blessed by the pagan prophet. 
frustrated. The king sends him away without payment and without honor. And sadly, in chapter 25, we hear that Balaam schemed a new way to get his payday. By conspiring with the Midianites, he told them, use your women to seduce the Israelite men into sin. And by the time you get to chapter 31, we learn that Balaam and countless other Midianites would be killed in battle with the Israelites. Now, often people like to focus on the, uh, the talking donkey in this part. Yeah, no, not, not that guy, a different one, different one. Yeah, I guess that's more like it, right? Which admittedly is a memorable part of this story, but I want to draw our attention to a simple but powerful reminder. A heart unchanged by God is blind to sin. We must experience a reset in our hearts because if this is left unchecked, we are likely to succumb to similar errors as Balaam. In Ezekiel 36, 26, God describes how he is able to reset our hearts. He says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. You see, God is in the business of creating new things. And if we want to receive the blessings God has for us and to avoid the errors that Balaam was victim to, we must be prepared to take steps toward resetting our hearts and learning to develop and mature as believers. Here's three takeaways from Balaam's story that we need to understand. The first one is, you don't have to pray about what God has already spoke about. For Balaam, we see him first speaking with God back in verse 12. And God clearly says, you shall not go with these men and you shall not curse these people. Yet when Balaam gets his second more lucrative offer, he seems to think that he should Ask God if he's sure about what he said the first time. That's not audacity, y'all. That's just dumb. God does not change like shifting shadows. He's not looking at your life like he's placing an order at Chipotle. Like, yeah, give me some of the pico and uh, let's do less. And che- <laughs> no cheese. Sorry, I got to watch the calories. No way. That is not how God is working. God has made his will perfectly clear. But man, how many of us can see ourselves in this action? God says, love your enemies. And we pray, are you sure? Like even even that guy? God says, go and make disciples. And at the dinner table, we ask God if he wants us to invite our neighbors to a small group or to church. God says what he means. And he means what he says. When we try to manipulate God through this kind of prayer, We are really just revealing our sinful desires. Now, what if you're saying, well, wait, Scott, didn't didn't God change his mind? And he said, yes. God allowed it, but it's not what God wanted. In fact, that's, that's not just confusion. That's a tragedy. In Romans 1, God speaks about how he gave them over to the lusts of their flesh. He gave them over to their sin. Christian, If you're here this morning, that should be one of the most frightening things you could ever imagine. That God might one day say, I'll just give you over to your sin. I'll stop trying to prevent it. I love to ask this question to teenagers, and we've got such an awesome youth group. um, They they never fall for it. I'll say, do you think it would be better to have parents who let you do whatever you want or to have parents that have a couple rules? And they often say, well, if I had parents let me do whatever I want, I feel like they wouldn't care about whatever happened to me. When God said go, it reminds me of when someone says, fine, if that's what you want, go. Second one, we can't see the light of God when we love the darkness of sin. I love that God opens the mouth of the donkey to pretty much lecture Balaam. This is personally hilarious to me that God effectively mocks the most renowned pagan spiritual man of the era by having a donkey argue with him. And honestly, I feel like the donkey won. In hindsight, we begin to see the full picture. 
Balaam ignored three obvious signs of distress from his donkey. And it's not like that's no big deal. For years, people have at least acknowledged the observations of animals. I mean, my dog isn't exactly Lassie, but there was one time at night where he started barking all crazy at the back door, and I knew there was some kind of treachery afoot. Someone, someone was out there. So I did the appropriate thing, and I called my wife to go check it out. <laughs> but seriously, though, Balaam had several opportunities to evaluate what was going on and at a minimum take stock of his surroundings. But he couldn't be disturbed from his sinful intent. Jesus declared that a light has come into the world, but the people love the darkness because their deeds are evil. What is most concerning about this observation is that when we set our mind on some sins, we can be so, so crafty, so caught up in tunnel vision that we lose sight of our true nature. Like Balaam, we get ourselves into sin trouble when we don't turn back. When all the signs are there, all the grace-filled obstacles God puts in our path, yet we press on toward folly. Balaam could only see his pending payment. And thus, he missed the presence of God directly in front of him. Number three, God wants you, not your superficial devotion. Even though Balaam says directly to King Balak, I can only speak what God puts in my mouth, he continues to go through with all the sorts of pomp and circumstance. He has Balak build seven altars with seven bulls and seven rams. Now I admit this is just my speculation, but if Balaam already knows what God wants him to say, what is the point of all of this, if not an attempt to impress God into changing his mind? One last desperate heave for the payday of his dreams. He repeats the same ceremony a second time when the first oracle isn't preferable to King Balak. God is unmoved. This is because this, this big show, this religious performance is never going to impress God. In Hosea 6, God says to the prophet, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Empty religiosity does not impress God. It didn't work for Balaam, and do not think it will work for you. If your week consists of a double lifestyle, where you act one way at home or at work, and then on Sunday morning you got your hands lifted up with the best of them, do not think you have deceived God. He wants your relationship, not your religious responsibility. I once heard a pastor say, you cannot come to church every day, every Sunday, to only sit in a pew and expect to become a Christian any more than you can sit in your garage once a week and expect to become a car. There is a real heart relationship that must grow between us and God. And hopefully you're asking right now, what does it look like to have a heart changed by God? I'm glad you asked, because here's number four, how to have a heart changed by God. So if you didn't know already or didn't know this about me, I love books, I love to read, and I'm so grateful for all the awesome insights we can gain um, from them. A wonderful book that helped guide uh, my study for this part of this next section uh, came from Bruce Walkies. It's called Finding the Will of God. Uh, super helpful. It's going to be a, a really kind of guided this next section. But I want to just recommend it to you. If you've ever kind of asked yourself, what is, what is God's will for my life? Or what does God want me to do? Um, it's a phenomenal book. It's only like 150 pages if you skip the appendix and the introduction. But it really even talks about, is that the right question? And, and really breaks down, what does it look like to understand what God really wants from your life? Phenomenal book, phenomenal read. And so let's take a look at how we can actively develop a heart for God. All right, our first one. Are your desires in agreement with Scripture? Our desires ought to come from our time with God. Unlike most instant gratification things in our world, we must be willing to invest the time to build a relationship with God. Through this, we can be assured that we are developing a godly mind. Out of Proverbs 2, My son, if you receive my words 
and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Like any deep relationship in your life, the more time you spend with that person, the more they begin to change you. When I first met my wife, I did not like to eat vegetables at all. But after having been married for almost 10 years, y'all, I put spinach on my tacos. Like, you know, I'm getting there. That's progress. But in all seriousness, when I want to buy a present for my wife, I don't second guess myself wondering if it's the right choice or if it's weird or awkward. You see, I love her and I know her deeply. And thus, I can trust that I'm making the right choice when I follow my heart's desire for her. Number two, are your desires presenting your body as a living sacrifice? You might recognize this phrasing from Romans 12.1 when Paul challenges us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. In its simplest form, God wants the liberty to influence any area of your life. Nothing held back. He wants all we have and all we know to be fair game. In doing this, we are effectively transformed. We are made new. We no longer conform to the way of this world, but instead we have new minds that can think in a completely new way. We can seek the things God seeks. We cannot go halfway on this. God does not want lukewarm. There may be some areas of your life that you are better at releasing to God's leadership than others, and I understand that. But at a minimum, deny yourself the right to claim anything as exclusively your own. By releasing more of your control, you invite more of God's influence into your life, and your desires will be greatly affected by his leading. Just imagine the blessings that would come from your thoughts, actions, attitudes, and feelings. Influenced by a holy, all-knowing, entirely loving God. As a result, we can begin to trust and follow our desires as an outward expression of God's will in our lives. Number three, are your desires in agreement with faith? I once had a friend tell me in high school, if you have to lie about it, then you probably shouldn't do it. It was as wise then as it is now. In fact, if you ever find yourself in a position where you cannot confidently declare, Amen! after your actions, then you must ask yourself whether this is something God would want you to be doing. An easy way to look at this is, are your actions born from a heart that loves and believes God? Perhaps I were to steal 20 bucks from someone, and then I donate it to a, to a homeless person. While from one perspective, it may look like a good deed done from one human to another, but the reality is, it was not an action done in faith to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Admittedly, there are times where this faith element can feel subjective or more like a gray area. In Romans 14, Paul gives us an awesome example of two men who differ in their faith, their understanding of what pleases God. One man believes he must only eat vegetables. <laughs> and the other believes it's acceptable to eat all things. Paul's instruction is for neither man to look down on the other, but to instead act accordingly to his faith. Our faith is built around our concern for pleasing God. Establish your desires around your concern for whether or not God is pleased with your conduct. And rest assured, you are developing a heart for God. All right, number four. Are your desires in agreement with prayer? Can there ever be authentic relationship without authentic communication? Just as our friendships and marriages would suffer from a lack of communication, as does our relationship with God suffer from a lack of time spent in communication with him. If your prayer life is waning, so too will your understanding of God's ways and desires. 
You never accidentally drift closer to God. Instead, you drift away. We must be prepared to invest in constant communication with God. When we pray to God and ask for his wisdom, we're not asking for him to reveal his will. Instead, we are asking for him to develop his character of wisdom in our lives. We learn to think more like the mind of God. In prayer, we are once again requesting God's influence in our lives. We share with him our hurts, our joys, our fear, our dreams. And through our prayers, God shapes our hearts and our desires. Paul challenges us to pray unceasingly, to think, to regularly think of God, talking with him, sharing our thoughts with him. In this way, you are constantly submitting your mind to the influence of God, and inevitably, you will think his thoughts. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord. But only what he sees the father doing, for whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. Jesus saw perfectly the acts of God in each day. And we too can experience this through the reset of our hearts and minds as we commit our desires to scripture. As we commit our desires to presenting our bodies as living sacrifices. As we commit our desires to faith and prayer. Through this, we can have a heart for God and avoid the spiritual blindness that led to Balaam's destruction. You see, Balaam failed to have a heart for God. And sadly, there will be some who hear this message and nothing will change. Others might see this list and, and feel like it's impossible. God expects too much from me. But allow me to encourage you, dear friends. There is yet a message left uncovered in our story, a simple truth God designed for his people to learn from this story. The Israelites would have recognized it and been emboldened for their Lord. The message for us is this. God is sovereignly working for the benefit of his people. When Israel's enemies conspired to wage war against them, they even sought the aid of a dark arts seer and they failed. When the king of Moab declares his intention to curse the people of God, he instigates a competition against the will of God who once promised to Abraham that his people would be a great nation, a blessed people. And Balak and Balaam fail to curse God's people. No matter what person, enemy, or foe conspires to work against you, no matter what circumstance or darkest pit you find yourself in, God is sovereignly working for your good. That is his promise in Romans 8, 28, that God is working all things for the good of those who are called to his purpose. Because neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you believe this? Do you really own this? It's a blood-bought promise just for you. In fact, I want you to put your name in that verse right now and hear it again. For me, it would say, Scott, there is no height or depth or anything else in all creation that will be able to separate you, Scott, from the love of God. Do you know the supremacy of God over all sin? Do you know the victory of Jesus for the child of God? You have great encouragement that no matter your struggle, no matter your adversity, no matter the condition of your heart this morning, Jesus is coming to make all things new. And guess what, y'all? He's already paid the price for your blessing. Let him reset your heart this morning. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for being a, a God who blesses your people. Lord, I thank you that there is no power, no entity, no anything in the infinity of existence that can ever work against your will. Your word is true. Your word is good. We have hope in the name Jesus. We know that even the things that people plan for evil, like Joseph once said, what you intended for evil, God used for the good and for saving of many. Lord, we are so grateful that your sovereign hand is orchestrating beauty in our lives. 
Help us to be patient to see it. Help us to have faith to trust it. And God, I also wanted to, we just want to say thank you for, for even using a donkey to share your truth and your wisdom. Because God, we are much more valuable to you than donkeys. And if you can use a donkey, you can definitely use people like us. God, thank you for calling us to the, your mission, to making your will clear, to go, and also to receive, to receive the grace of Jesus. Lord, let us not forget it for a moment. And if you're here this morning, if someone's here this morning and they say, Scott, I'm not there. My heart isn't there yet. I still have some questions. Well, friend, me too. So many of us do, but God has truth. He is the way. I want you to spend time in prayer. Ask God to help you have the faith. Ask questions. Continue to come. And trust me, God will reveal himself to you just like he revealed himself to Balaam. And if he resets our hearts, Lord, we know you're going to use it for something awesome. Thank you, God. Please continue to use us to your glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.